Welcome to tonight's podcast with Ryan Sean O'Reilly, David Wilkinson, and Richard Mell. This is There Is No Deodorant in Outer Space. Now, let's begin. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, and welcome to another edition of There Is No Deodorant in Outer Space. I'm your beloved host, Ryan Riley, and with me, the golden boy of Shock Jock Podcast, David Wilkinson. Hi. <laughs> you are you are beloved. I, 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 I got caught up when you said beloved. I had a comment working, and I just, I just lost it. So yeah, hello. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and my other esteemed co-host, Richard Mel. Hey, looking forward to this one, guys. Good. Yes, this edition we are going to be doing the famous book by Terry Pratchett called "Going Postal" and the BBC film version directed by John Jones, which is also called "Going Postal." Well, why don't you give me any opening comment you have for the show? A sentence summary or something like that. It's like Han Solo if he was British and there was no outer space. Very nice. Very Rick. cool. Oh man, I can't come up with one right now. Yeah, I, 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 I can't either. <laughs> I, 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 yeah. for, my, for my opening comment, I'll say uh, you're definitely not going to return the book to sender. Uh, hey! uh, uh, oh god, <laughs> it's I just it's it's an awesome book. It's an awesome movie. Rick, you you have anything to say to just kind of set it up? Um, you know, I I feel that the the book. It is extremely refreshing, and I uh, am inspired to read more of uh, Terry Pratchett. Yeah. So, let's start off with a little bio about this author, very prolific author, Terry Pratchett, a resident of England, I believe. Yeah, Buckinghamshire, England, born in uh, 1948. Always a smart student, but uh, he claimed that he got most of his education at the local library. Spent a lot of hours there reading as much as he could, read, read profusely. He credited all of his education uh, to being in the library and just delving into whatever he could find. He, he mentioned he read quite a bit of uh, variety. Uh, he said that any serious kind of writer in, in getting into uh, <laughs> his craft would, should read uh, like a variety outside your genre, as he said. Uh, so he did quite a bit of that. It, this guy did he did he yeah. did he um did he finish school? I thought he dropped out of school at some point. No, he he uh he not only finished school, but he was he was great in school. Every school he he attended, uh, he got A's and he was an exemplary student. I, I think he he was just so sharp and brilliant. He just probably thought it was friggin' boring because teachers are always kind of teaching to the uh, the dumb blokes in the class out there in England. But yeah, Terry Pratchett never really had a academic problem going to school. He always kind of was well-prepared and uh, passed with flying colors. What else can I say about this guy? He, he, his main body of work was uh, Discworld, and within that uh, series of books, he published 42 of them uh, from 1983 to, I think his last one was published in 2011, or maybe it was 2009. But uh, his body of work is huge. Um, his fourth publication was kind of what got the, the, the most critical acclaim and kind of sent him off uh, to writing for his own kind of uh, income. It's when he was able to quit his job. He did write quite a bit uh, while having a full-time job as a journalist. And uh, he was I, – I think, you know, he, he always wanted to write professionally, but – reality kind of sunk in and he had a talk with his parents and he ended up doing journalism for quite some time uh, from like the uh, early 60s all the way up to like the early 80s. So a good 20 years he was in journalism. And I guess his first beat was uh, covering something where it, that had to do with uh, uh, dead body. So I sort of saw a dead body his first day out on the job. And he just, you know, serious business. It hit him immediately and he uh kind of i don't know if it affected him that much but uh just one of those little anecdotes but um what else being extremely boring here i think he would write he would write after work 
And then he was starting to get published after, um, you know, just writing in his spare time. And then he eventually started getting published. And I think it wasn't his last job. Did he work for like, like the PR division of like a nuclear, a, a nuclear thing? Yeah. Like he, he said it was lucky for him to be changing out of that job because it was during the time when they had some kind of nuclear fallout, uh, at a, at a plant and he was on his way out. So Godzilla. Yeah. <laughs> Which may or may not be confirmed. Right. Real quick, do you think anyone besides an English guy can pull off the name Terry? I mean, okay, well, first of all, you got to be white, I think, a white male. But you don't, you don't see any other ethnicity of men going by the name Terry. No, uh, that's not true. I, who? I can't picture it. Asian, hmm. black, I don't Hispanic. Know. I, I, don't, I, can't think of, I, I can't think of any other white guy named Terry right now. I mean... I don't think Terry's very German. <laughs> I don't think any German people had Terry as a name, but to say I I can't think of any male Terrys that I've ever met, and I mean if I was named Terrence, I don't know Terror, I can see me be going be known as Terror. Oh, it's Terror. He's a fucking Terror. <laughs> that, that kind of thing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I I I I wouldn't go with Terry. It's so, even his middle name's David John. So I mean DJ TDJ would have been good, but like how do you come up with Terry? I don't know the origin of that. Odd choice out of all those names. Yeah, I don't know many Terry's. Uh, I know more Randy's than Terry's. They're kind of similar names, but... Uh, yeah. Randall, Randy. Randy yeah, I've, Terry. Again, I've, I've only met white guys named Randy. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. Well, and, and the uh, the thing about this Terry is um, he's certainly distinguished. He's uh, He's got an, a number of uh, awards and made tons of best- bestseller lists. And what, Rick, what you were telling me before, yeah. what his, what, how did his books rank like really high up there in, a, in some of the bestsellers? Yeah, some, lists? uh, you know, authoritative source on all, you know, British literary, uh, you know, uh, books and all that. Throughout the history, they like rated the top 500 British, you know, pieces of fiction. Okay. And, what the what were, what were the statistics that I I told you about? Um, he, he has seven books in the top 100 in uh, British literature. I think he he ranks a few in the top 50. And the only other author who shares uh, that kind of volume in the top 100 is Charles Dickens. Uh, so this guy is a serious yeah yeah he's a serious player. He's I mean his writing is of extraordinary quality. Okay, I mean he's just He's extremely rich in his, his writing. He takes it so seriously, and he should. I mean, that's how he makes his living. And but and he's very prolific he's too. Oh my, very talented. Oh my god. Yeah. Um. But uh, I and it's almost unfortunate that he was kind of overshadowed by um, rolling and all the the Potter phenomenon because that just yeah. kind of like eclipsed all of his, of his work. And but you know he had his opportunities to become. But he's powerful. got much more. He's Go ahead. He's got a much more uh, voluminous catalog. Oh my than she god! Has. Okay, so so this guy is um, so amazing that uh, he's been knighted. Uh, his his sigil is uh, like an ankh with an owl uh, standing on the shield, and it, it, that's another interesting thing about uh, Pratchett is that he's a humanist and that he doesn't believe in uh, superstition or religion or anything like that, and he is quite a um, astronomer. He is an environmentalist, uh, just has all the qualities of a real rational type of person, type of you know, he, I, that, that's the kind of person I respect, you know, it's just, and, and if I was a chick, if I was a chick, a rational man would get me wet every time. There you go. <laughs> Take Stop note. Uh, right. I, I know, um, a little fun factoid about him is that, um, in his later years, he, uh, said that he always wanted to make his own sword and he went and collected uh, raw iron ore, and I think parts oh, of um, yeah. parts of metal from a meteorite that fell from the sky to add some extra. He, uh, yeah, he actually dug out the iron ore. Yeah, and yeah. someone someone he, helped him that he knew that knew how to do it, but he like uh, smelted his own sword or whatever. Yeah, he did it from yeah. complete scratch. I mean, they started the freaking fire with a bow, <laughs> um, and they said when he uh, he pulled it out of the 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 smelt or whatever the hell they call it. He touched every square millimeter of it. I mean, he 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 just 
became one with it. I mean, it was, and this was after he was knighted. This is making me feel kind of bad. I feel like I'm not doing anything with my life the more we talk about this guy. <laughs> I know. We should, we should really review writers that kill themselves when they're 30. I feel much, I feel morally superior. And you remind me. Personally, I, professionally. <laughs> it, it, this is interesting too. I mean, he's got Alzheimer's. Uh, he's having problems reading. Uh, he can't, he can't read. He can't type on the keyboard anymore. And yeah, he has to uh, dictate his books now, right? And he's actually done a BBC documentary about assisted death. And he, I mean, it's just like he's he's going to do it as soon as his uh, Alzheimer's hits like a critical point. He's going to do it. So yeah, it's it's really. Um, just, before we get too off topic about his writing style, I just wanted to throw one thing in there. It was kind of a um, his, his he's very his his words are very rich and well chosen, but in a different kind of vein than what I'm used to for that kind of style. It's very it's comically perfect and it creates a a vast world. He reminded me of Cormac McCarthy, and which I've only read. Two of his Cormac McCarthy books, we should read one next year, The Road, which I haven't read yet, but it's a, it's a good choice for the show. But it's the same outlay of chapters where he, he puts in these little bullet points to kind of say what's going to happen in the chapters. The chapters are fairly lengthy, but there's not a wasted word anywhere. And that's what I kind of, that's why, that's the, the similarities between him and Cormac McCarthy that I picked up hmm. beyond that. Are you talking about the chapter headings? Yes. Yeah. McCarthy does the same thing, the two. I, I read about that. That I, I think that this book is the only one that he did that with. I'm not really? sure if it's, <laughs> it's one of two. It's one of two books that he's written with chapters. Yeah, he normally doesn't even write with chapters, and this one has a chapter heading, and then it has all this like, like words setting up what's going to happen. Chapter, and I think he did it stylistically because I think this is of like a Victorian age fantasy book, and it's um it's something that w- was uh, popular in Victorian books or something like that. But I, I guess the other books he's written don't really have that element. Okay, interesting. For whatever reason, he I don't know why he decided to do this book like that, but it just reminded me of Blood Meridian, which was uh, had a very had a very similar yeah. chapter style. The same. Uh, anyways, okay, but I digress. Very, very, both very good authors, but like very, they don't waste words, and uh, no. I don't know. It, it, it was almost like comedy yeah. poetry. I thought. I mean, I was. I don't want to use the cliche of la- laughing out loud, but I, I did laugh out loud when I read this, and Me I too. kept like reading things to my long suffering wife, and she's like, "What the fuck are you talking about?" <laughs> like, well, if you if you read the, if you read the first three chapters, it'd be hilarious now. So, and uh, there we go. But it, you know. It, it, that's the thing, and he and he does a lot of wordplay and word puns, but none of it's bad. It's all like he just really plays with words, and it's just, you you do you laugh out loud when you or, read this book. Or you know, it could be bad, but he makes it work because I really got yeah. sucked into the books. I mean, I really I was I I, I somehow I could see the world from the first few pages, and I was really into it. And the, the book, I probably I feel like I read the book in three hours, and you know, I, I it took longer than that, but it, it's, it's like a three hundred and some page book, but it was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. You know? Well, anything else that anyone wants to add about Pratchett himself, and we can move on. To the book then i'll say one more thing well, he uh well, sure. he claimed okay. he claimed that he sat down for like 27 hours and read lord of the rings i thought that was pretty cool oh really yeah 27 straight hours wow <laughs> look, look were you gonna add something I was I was curious if he and Douglas Adams were buddies. I did not research that. I, I didn't see anything about that. I don't know. I mean, they're they're contemporaries, right? But the their writing styles sort of is kind of similar, right? With the humor, fantasy. I, mean, I I I feel like it is, and I have not read a lot of contemporary British humor writers. So these are the two I, that I can think of. Uh, and I guess is Ronald is uh Ronald Dahl is he British? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I know Douglas. I know, is. Whatever, but yeah, but Douglas Adams. I yeah. mean, it, it does like when you read Pratchett, you think of Douglas Adams, and you and it's a similar style, a similar humor. Adams, I guess, is more science fiction, and Pratchett's more fantasy uh, ish. You know. Yeah, and uh, speaking of fantasy, he he thinks fantasy gets shortchanged a whole lot. He thinks a lot more literature should be considered fantasy. Just even something like uh, I don't know, pick something that's just popular um you know downton abbey okay that he would call that fantasy i I was listening to an interview today where he was talking about uh this and he he said um you know whatever he was writing about he said he didn't think his fantasy is a a traditional wizards and wax type of fantasy and it's not but he said you know if you he's like if you throw one dragon in there they'll call it fantasy no matter what the rest of the book is about and and I think that goes to what you're saying, Rick, about how the, some people will just shortchange these genres just be, be based on the genre, yeah. not the quality of writing. But I think that the genre was uh, validated quite a bit when he was knighted. Oh. I mean, that was that was yes. something. But uh, yeah. And yeah. certainly, you know, 
with with Tolkien and and Pratchett and right. you know Martin and Rob. I mean, a lot of people now it's becoming you know obviously a lot lot more mainstream and accepted. But uh, but he would they would they knight J.K. Rowling or is she like not allowed because she's a girl or uh, what? I don't know that they discriminate on that nowadays. But um, I don't know. Maybe it's who knows if she, maybe she will be one day. It's inter- it's that whole thing is kind of interesting and. They, I, he was, he had some honor before he was knighted, and then he, you know, he's done a lot now. He donated like a million dollars for um, research to to cure, you know, Alzheimer's, and he's done like a lot of yeah. philanthropic work, I think. Like, um, and I think then that's when they, you know, they knighted, you know, this is the reason, or some paper or something said this is the reason why we still keep the, the knight, like the knighting system, you know, to because it's honor like exemplary citizens, essentially, you know, this is why it's still good to knight people to recognize efforts like this. So he's well loved uh and for good yeah. reason, for very good reason. <clears throat> so that's I, th- I think that should wrap it up and we let's talk move on to the story here. Okay. Well, I'll let you do a synopsis of the book, but let me just premise it with that this book is I guess part of uh what did you say uh Rick like 40 plus books in the the disc world, which is a fantasy world created by Pratch uh, which takes place on a world shaped as a disc as opposed to a globe. And it, I'll try to put a link on the website. There are different theories on how to read these books because it's not like uh, the same characters are in all 40 books. There's sort of like different story arcs and different themes. There is like a whole set of books on these wizards. There's And, and there's an overlap in the books too. And there, But there's a whole set of books on the Night Watch who are like the policemen. And then this book, Going Postal, is a part of uh, an arc that is set in like a Victorian age or industrial age. Whereas some of the other books are more like older in the time of Discworld. So I just wanted to kind of throw that context out there. That this is part of this larger world, but I'll, Wilk, I'll let you take it from there. Okay, well, a book synopsis. Uh, I'm going to make this brief. It's kind of got, let's say, three acts. Uh, the first act, you have the main character who finds himself at the gallows. He is a swindler. He's a con man, and he's been sentenced to die. And it's already hilarious, despite my description at this point. So it's it's a very funny book, and I was pretty invested to the first ten pages. Anyways, the death is faked. He goes to meet the. Uh, uh, the chancellor, Patrician, or yeah, yeah. basically the, the head guy, yeah. the ruler. Yeah, that's I hate that word. The <laughs> <laughs> patrician, the patty cake man, and he he gives him the, the choice of death or you can run the post office. And he doesn't really give him a lot more instructions than that. I mean, it's it's it's, it's and then you know he ultimately chooses neither and tries to run away. He gets brought back through various mechanisms. He then. Act two, he, he, well, not really act two, he runs the post office and, uh, basically the post office, it was put out of business or is being ignored. One, because they don't really deliver the mail. And because there's a thing called clacks, which are pretty much, you know, call it the internet, fax machines, whatever. It's a different way to convey messages. And the post office is competing against that and the clacks are being run into the ground. So he starts getting things going, meets a girl. Then people start dying, and it gets a little bit darker than I thought it was going to get, which is kind of interesting. And there's a whole subplot about a subspecies who are being, you know, enslaved, the golems. And then in the end, there's a delicious, t- you, know, you know, twist of irony and a very similar situation, and I don't want to spoil the book for those who haven't read it. Or do I? I don't I don't really know. Well, I think we, like, try not to spoil it, but at the same time, we are trying to review books, so I don't want to be too anal about spoil alerts, because this is, we're trying to do a criticism of works, too. Yeah, I, 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 I love the ending, really, the last, you know, I thought it was really satisfying how the antagonist ends up having to make the same choice and chooses just to walk out the door and presumably die, but ultimately Moist embraces the job, and he does a good job, and he, uh, it's, it's a, it's a lovely journey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, it is. I mean, that's that's a pretty quick synopsis. But um, I think I, I don't know. If, I don't think you mentioned this, but one key uh, element to the books is the main character, Moist von Lipwig, is a con artist. I, I think I did mention that, didn't I? Yeah. Oh, did you? Okay, I'm, yeah. I apologize. So he has uh, been making his living by swindling people, and he's sort of like a what a small time, medium time con artist, where he'll he'll do like you know three month three three card monty tricks on the street, and he'll uh, but he's sort of graduated to uh, making fake bonds and swindling people out of money that way. Um, but in in the process of his conning making a living by being a con man he sort of has lost his identity and kind of is just living his 
I don't think he really knows who he is himself. And he, he's, he's just been busy living out these cons and trying to make a quick buck. And the book, sort of the sweeter side of the book, is the, the self-discovery of that character to find out that there's a little bit more to him than he himself realizes. And he he's a better person than maybe he, he thought he was. And he's, he's contrasted against, like, as the main antagonist, which is Richard Gilt, who is a con man in a much larger scale uh, and much more violent scale. He's sort of like what the, the Bernie Madoff of that world. Well, he was described as kind of like a pirate, uh, which I, I think is very accurate. Uh, y- y- the book is contemporary because Richard Gilt is this this figure that calls all these shots. Yeah, explain and, Richard Gilt. Like he he's he's supposed to be a pirate, but he's he's in a corporate setting. Yeah, I mean he's just made out of money, uh, and he's kind of like the he is the board of directors of this this corporation that takes over the clack system, and you know instead of providing this service to people to use at their convenience and the clack system is just, you know, speeding up communication in a world of, of, you know, the written letter. Well, explain the the clack system is a series of towers that can send. Yeah. Mechanized towers that uh, send signals uh, with a system of shutters. So since it's a mechanical system, it needs maintenance all the time, but his, his motivation is purely profit. Richard Gilt. Richard. And making himself the only game in town, Richard Gilt. This this is his business motto. He, he wants to eliminate all competitors and make himself the only business in town so that he can charge as much as he wants, so on and so forth, uh, perpetuate a monopoly. Mm-hmm. At the same time, he doesn't do the costs that are involved with running such uh, a grand system. Mm-hmm. Um, so the system is falling apart, and he's willing to just kind of Take the money, and as soon as everything's about to implode, his his game is he's just going to sell it. Yeah. And in the meantime, while the thing runs, he's going to market it to every extent that he can to get people to keep keep on using it. Yeah, he is the embodiment of a cold corporate world that we don't care about making money, and we don't care even about our own business or taking pride in it. The clack system was actually invented by other people that were good inventors and creators and doers, but were not good businessmen. And they kind of got swindled out of it by this Richard Gilt and um, his, his corporate partners who are called the grand trunk. And so they, they don't care, especially Richard Gilt and he'll do anything to meet his ends, which is just make to make money, including, you know, underhanded stuff. Right. So, you know, he, he's a corporate pirate, and, and in today's day and age, uh, people are so rich like that, that they are truly pirates. They, you know, instead of uh, going into villages and just raping and pillaging people, they're, they're taking over these services and just giving customers crap service, and it's all so ephemeral, you know, they're only there for the buck, and then they move on. Or, or you know, just kind of like the old pirates, where they, you know, they were just kind of out there looking for other things to pillage. It was just that... Yeah. Same stuff goes on today. And, and to my point, I think when the main character um, takes charge of the post office and really digs into it, which he's kind of half-heartedly getting into it, just using it as a means to end in the beginning, he thinks he's still, still trying to think of how he can get out of it. But eventually he kind of gets wrapped up doing the momentum of it and uses his old con skills to turn the post office around because it's all dilapidated and not functioning. And he, he, by making the post office more successful, it puts him against Richard Gilt in a way that Gilt had been challenged in a while. And suddenly um, the protagonist looks at himself and Richard Gilt and he sees Richard Gilt as another con man and perhaps a superior one. And he talks about maybe admiring him in some context. And then he realizes how kind of evil and how hurtful guilt can be and then i guess moist thinks about how he hurt people with his old cons and he suddenly starts to want to f- distinguish himself he, he thinks well I, I don't want to be that guy and that's when the story i think kind of has a heart right well well in the in the very beginning of the book i mean he, he he's and they do this in the movie too where he emphasizes that you can't con an honest man and i and i think that that philosophy, whether he 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 caught his own shortcomings eventually, but like that at, at at his core, at his heart, he wasn't at guilt. He wasn't he wasn't an evil person. He was truly going after people he thought were making themselves were putting themselves in harm's way through their own sin, I guess. And I don't know, but yeah, yeah, he said he would play off people's greed, right? You know, he he'd sell them the fast buck because they wanted they wanted to try to get the fast buck. He wasn't after the honest people, and that that's what the con men said. 
is you can't count us you can't count an honest man right yeah to make the perception that all honest people think that they're just impervious to cons which they're that's the far that's far from the truth and, you know another thing about this book is the characters i mean look what did you think about all the different i mean there's tons of characters and i, I kind of feel like they're all pretty memorable um yes <laughs> <laughs> well i mean the postal workers um there is only two. When Moist takes over the post office, there's only two: Tolliver Groat and Stanley Howler. And I mean, how do you remember all their names? God, I, you're, you're, yeah, I'm like, I remember stories. Yeah, sorry, I'm referencing uh, my my source. I have my I stuff in front of me. The notes. But uh, Groat, plus the the names that Pratchett comes up with are uh, <laughs> sometimes somewhat unforgettable. Well, my, 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 but Groat, yeah, Stanley um, was my fan favorite at first. That was the one that I, I, I mean, and again, explain him. <laughs> explain him. <laughs> well. <laughs> I mean, no one knows what you're talking about. Autistic. No, I mean, he's based yeah. autistic. Yeah, he's, he, he likes pin, like the whole pin thing for me for a loop. He's like, he, I mean, the, when you first introduce him, I mean, I, I try. It's how do we explain this to a person who hasn't read the book? It, it, it's it's kind of. Uh, I mean, the way that he's presented the book, it's a, you know, it's a very you know, he, almost a draconian atmosphere. The, everyone's like kind of ill at ease, and he walks in the room, and Stanley he just kind of blurts out, "I like pins." And, and, and he gets in an argument with him about like what pin magazines are the best and which ones aren't, and he's upset. Turns out he's an editor for one, and I'm like, this is a very it, just the obscured absurdity of that. Just kind of, I, I I don't know. I, I loved everything about this book. I mean, like, really, I, it's frankly, I had trouble keeping track of the characters, and I wasn't even trying to for a while. I mean, the names at least. I mean, I felt like the story, and I felt like I missed a lot of context in this book for not reading the other ones. And then I read a few things online. And it turns out I didn't. Maybe I just read it too fast. So I, I, yeah, because uh, I don't think his books necessarily carry carry all. I think they a lot of them you can read standalone, especially this one. Yeah, I I, I felt that way. I mean, I I got a lot out of this book. I didn't think I was missing out on any other kind of uh, angle that was coming in from another book. It was, you know. Well, I, I wasn't sure if I should know who some of the characters were ahead of time. Yeah, like that that, no. that that was my. I'm like, I wonder if they've been mentioned before, referenced before, and yeah, turns out not not as not to the degree I thought it might have been. So. I guess I'm saying is, yeah, you can you can jump into the book. Yeah, this and this is the first um, book about this main character, I think, Moist uh, Lipwig. Mm -hmm. I think this is his first book. Um, but yeah, th this book is def of all the Discworld books. This, I mean, this is definitely one you could just ju just start reading. <laughs> yeah, I, I I I thoroughly enjoyed it, and and I, and I think part of my attitude, though, honestly, I, I'd mentioned this to you probably off. Well, definitely off mic before, but like I wasn't keen on starting a series, mid series, in a, that I haven't read. It's really my attitude when I read this book was that I'm just going to go through it quickly, which I did, and cause I'm probably going to understand half of it. And I realize now I probably they, uh, the first couple of prologues. They, the they, fuck were those? I don't know the fuck those are talking. About. Yeah. Well, the eight thousand year prologue yeah. and the nine month prologue. Well, that, that, well, that did they that kind of kick it off for you? Like, oh, here we go. You know, we're we're in for like a, uh, you know, yeah, okay, yeah. Well, Honestly, I read that and I then I put, didn't touch it again for a week. Oh yeah, I can see that. I can see <laughs> yeah. that. I, I'm like, ah, uh, fuck. Right. <laughs> so yeah, but it really is a, like a standalone book. I mean, it's the bottom line. It, it is, and I and I, I I didn't know that going into it. I had a bad yeah. attitude going into it, but it really kind of won me over really quickly. Like it, uh, yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, the the prologue was that it was it was her brother though, wasn't it? That was the the whole thing. The guy that died. I I didn't even remember. I, I just remember it kind of but, sets up the humor. Yeah, that was John Deerhart dying. Yes. But it, you know the the nine month prologue, John John Deerhart dies, but they don't mention the banshee at all. You know it, that remains to be seen. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot going on. What do you, Rick? What do you think about the golems, which are they play a, yeah, a significant golems. role in this book? And a, a, a golem is actually um, a mythological creature from I think Jewish origins, and they're sort of like almost like they're automatons in one sense, uh, made of they're like people made of clay, and yeah. they're turned alive by magic and you know i i don't know what else yeah. uh goes with the myth for that but i do that makes sense oh, right. uh you oh, know well, go ahead and explain go ahead. golems because and Pratchett yeah, does this in his book he, no, was... he lifts from lots of different myths and kind of throws everything all together and shakes it up and then that's his stories but uh will go no. ahead the essence of a golem and, and the original hebrew folk tale about it is that everything you said is correct but it ultimately it turns against the person that made it that it, it's a it's a living breathing irony that once you create the golem, you can't stop it. And that concept has been used in horror movies. I think Tolkien named Gollum that for a reason. And it's ultimately like, it's like the best laid plans of mice and men will come back and bite the person that has evil in his heart. You know, the, uh, the golem is created to do damage and hurt someone, but the problem is yeah. you can't turn it off and it'll ultimately come back on the creator. And that, 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 that really is the essence of the, of the golem story. It's, and in uh, that myth so. is the golem programmed, uh, like it is, 
in uh, going postal. I mean, do, do they put a scroll in their head, and that's pretty much like the set of instructions? <laughs> that I don't know. Okay. That, that, that I don't know. The clay part is pretty much it. The, the, the instructions are usually to kill someone. They, the golem's created to kill someone in the story, but then it comes okay. back and ends up mangling the person that made it, like almost like in a Frankenstein-esque monster. I mean, the, the concept of like something that you create this is in the myth? hurting you. This is the like the the classic myth he's talking about. Oh, cool! It's it's a folk tale. It's a Jewish folk tale for like you know. Yeah. It's, 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 so, but that, that Pratchett tames them down significantly in his book, and right. they don't have uh, that kind of killing aspect. But Rick, what did you think about them in their context of the of this work? Well, I mean, the golem is uh, merely a tool, and they can be made into these insanely violent things, I'm sure. Uh, but since they seem to always be in the right hands in the context of the story, they're extremely moral beings. Um, they always kind of walk that high road. They don't, uh, they're unassuming, you know, they're sort of uh, ideal companions, and that's exactly what. Uh, Moist Litvig had uh, throughout the book. Uh, we had, he had this. well, this in, in this book, his, his golem, known as Pump Nineteen, is his parole officer, right? And set set on him by the 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 patrician, who is basically the the point of Pump Nineteen is to prevent Moist from escaping his duties to run the post office. Which he, when he first has the duty, he runs away, and the golem tracks him down. And the thing with the golem is, it it never sleeps, it never eats, right. it never gets tired, and it's eventually going to find you because it 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 knows your. Uh, I think they explain it with he knows it's uh, car, uh, karmic signature or something right. like that. But the the, the humorous part about the mm-hmm. golems is there is I don't know like sort of a PC aspect about them because the golems for they the history of my guess is that they're just great workers so people have been just using them to do just mindless awful tasks and this particular golem previously was living in, in like what 100 feet deep into the sea and just pumping water up the pump, city yeah for yeah, like two, two centuries he did this and then one day right he brought up to the light and that's because there's like sort of sort of like a political correct uh atmosphere going on and there's even like um, an organization that's trying to fight for the rights of golems and bring them out of these mindless services and, and make them fully realized citizens and stuff and they are but they aren't because they are still like you know who they are but they do prefer to to be free, and they're. I think that's what they're trying to do is uh, earn their freedom. And some of them they do earn their freedom through their service. Uh, but when they when they have a choice, like Rick said, they t- t- tend to choose more benevolence um, than harmful choices. I don't. Th- I, you know what? I don't think they ever have a choice. It's 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 written in the scroll. It's put into their head. That's who they are. Well, no, no that's not correct because if you remember, they're supposed to by contract have I think one day off a week just as. <laughs> so they're not seen like so they're not like Slaves, yeah. seen as like mechanical. Sabbath. Yeah. So um when the post office um suffers a fire, the golems come and help on their day off and they volunteer for it. Right, right. Okay. So on their day off do they take the scrolls out of their heads? No, I just think no. I, I, on the day off, they exercise free will. It sounds like that, that's that, that's my point. Is they 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 they're somewhat mechanical, but they're they're not. They do have some. Well, free will. He, yeah. I guess he didn't get into enough detail for us to kind of go there. But I mean, no, I just explained it. He does. He does. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Whatever. You know, like okay. Uh, but they are they are they, you are right they are sort of like Frankenstein esque. Uh, yeah, and the other go- uh, the other golem was. Uh, uh, on Hammerand, and uh, he he opened up like that nine thousand year prologue, and it's just an illustration to to kind of give you to make you understand how driven these things are. Uh, you know, he was waiting down on the floor of an ocean for for something. I you know he was kind of doing the job of delivering some mail nine thousand years ago. He had to deliver. Yeah, he had to deliver a message to like some god or something that. Didn't like the god's island or something disappear or something. He, he he was not able to fulfill his task. He he was on his way to a kingdom and the kingdom slid into the ocean. Yeah. And he was in the ocean and I think he was stuck or something like that. And you know, like this this anchor just kind of drops and hits the ocean floor and it was like the most exciting thing that happened to this golem in nine thousand years. And then it goes on to the nine month <laughs> prologue. And you're like, what the hell am I getting myself into? That that's like the first chapter yeah. of the book. But uh. It, he he was basically waiting for the universe to turn around and to cycle through the entire period of time that universes take. And I guess the theory is that if you wait wait long enough, it'll just repeat itself. So 
Mm-hmm. I mean, they're extremely driven beings, and you know that was just kind of like the illustration that that had to be explained to um, Moist by uh, Adora Deerheart. She knew all about it. So. And she and she is the daughter of the inventor of the clack system who got put out of business. And she also is like the love interest in the book. And she's also um, in charge of the golems and, and trying to get them jobs and, and rights, more rights in the society. That's who she is. Well, or, well, what did you think of the post office itself? Very untraditional setting or plot device for a fantasy work. Although this is sort of not... Uh, well, it's not a traditional fantasy work, but very unique and kind of uh, refreshing. To me, the post office, I mean, it, it added a lot of heart to the story. It's like this old sort of, I mean, everyone can kind of think nowadays of post offices being inefficient, unefficient well, you know, um, institutions that are run poorly, guess, yeah. oh, but you kind of are rooting for the post office in this book. At least I, that's how I felt. I was not, and let me tell you why. Okay. Um, this is, I mean, I, it was confusing to me. Well, I mean, I was rooting for the characters, but yeah. the, the, uh, there's something, there's some undercurrent in human nature where certain people, it's not, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's gotta be like some kind of brand of Asperger or autism, but some people just love the fucking post, postal service and post office. And it, it's like, there was a movie in the nineties called The Postman starring Kevin Costner at the height of his career where it's the apocalypse. And the whole point of the movie is he's going to start the postal service again. And I was like, what the fuck are you? Don't get water or electricity. No, we're going to get mail. No, who the fuck care? I mean, I, I've never liked mail. I've never liked mailing things. I don't like getting stuff in the mail. <laughs> it, I, I once looked at the envelope in the last year and I felt sick for two days. Um, so uh, seriously, I, 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 like, I, I've always cringed when I had to get a letter. I got a paper cut when I was a kid. I, I just don't, I don't fucking like post office or mail or letters. Well, what kind of letters yeah. are you getting that you cringe? I mean, I, 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 got, oh, I, I got a chain letter when I was a kid that said I was going to break my neck from, if I didn't like send it back. That was from my, my cousin, um, in Evanston. And I'm like, what the fuck is this about? Well, maybe that scarred you. I, well, yeah. Then, you know, it's just like, I, I just, I got clients coming in right now with letters that smell like wet dogs and cigarettes. <laughs> These are my bills. I'm like, okay, fine. I don't need your fucking bills I, I i just i don't see the need for the post office i mean i i really don't i never and then again but I, there's a certain some people like the, oh, the pony express was here who the fuck cares i mean i i guess i don't think people have that much to say um anyways but like you know, the idea of like sending letters and everything else i mean that's it's great but i mean i i, I was kind of with the the school of thought that you know they didn't really need a post office that, that was my thought the whole time it's like i they 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 moved past that already they had technology that kind of made it an antique and i don't know i mean they should have just burnt it down i mean it might I, it would have been a shorter book if i had written it where he just would have torched the place <laughs> in the beginning and been like yeah there's only a few letters here i mean why, why deliver them? they're like eh, they're sacred you know there's a certain like it's almost like the way autistic boys like trains the, some people like the post office it's it's a whole weird thing and i well, i, don't like, have I that. mean i think like a lot of people like getting packages you know it's usually it's something you want or you're looking for um yeah maybe people like, like FedEx getting, or you know people don't like getting bills but i think that's the nostalgia for the for the post office but also the the line that the, the character says in the book when he's making the argument to bring the post office back against the clack system which is almost like the internet or or cell phone service and he says you know can you seal a, a clax with a loving kiss you know can you send a uh, crushed flower petals in a in a clax message no you can't um the post office and sending letters is this like tactile thing you know back to our our roots so there's there is a, a, more of a nostalgia to to that kind of stuff and i think that does target people's you know heartstrings it certainly did for me and um I never thought of the post office in such a way before. I mean, I didn't really think. What? You, I, I, I got. I used to get letters from my grandma, who I love, God rest her soul. But like, she put flower petals in there. I'd open them up. I'm like, ah, oh, fuck! I got flower petals on the floor now. What the fuck is that doing for me? Why, why, why put flower petals in an envelope that you're gonna open up? You would have. You would have rather gotten a text message just... from your grandma. They you delete. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I've saved a lot of her letters. I, I'm actually in my office now. I got her letters here. They're very nice. But I always think to myself, like, why are you sending me? I mean, of all people, that uh, yeah, the, Grandma, why are you sending me world, letters? It's going to appreciate. No, I love her letters. I liked her letters a lot. Oh, okay. But I, I, I didn't like, uh, you know, the um, yeah, the the, fl- the flowers in there just seemed like a waste. I mean, you, yeah, she could have. I mean, who cares? Okay, fine. Yes, we all like things that are written. But you know, you can just hand somebody a letter sometimes too, and it's like, hey, here's a note. Well, notes another cool. another I love getting notes. Uh, point that got brought up that I thought was interesting, and I, I had thought about this before was that, um, you know, may you know, because people would criticize the post office for being bloated and inefficient and outdated, but I guess the argument against it was maybe 
some things are not meant to be a, a profitable thing. And maybe the profit is really, it benefits, it benefits society in general to have a system in place that you can, you know, send communications to people at any time, you, you know, you want, um, for relatively cheap. Now, there, there's so many ways to do that. Well, and, and yeah. I, I, I don't think the post office is necessary at all right now. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just, it's design, like, I mean, okay, for example, taxes last year, you know, file my taxes. I owe $110, $150 total. I um, have gotten probably 10 letters from the IRS, like six of them registered. They probably spent $90 on that item, $150. And I just paid it. I'm like, you're you're losing money here. But the post office is like a waste. It's it's, it's used by idiots to send things. Well, I mean, Uh, but in the danger, I mean, in this book, the clacks and the postal can run some uh, concurrently because they provide different services. But I think the the one of the maybe lessons here, maybe it's not a lesson, is that when the clax was you know privatized with corporate interests, it, it it also got run into the ground, and maybe you know privatization of you know things that are monopolies like utilities that shows how that can be a bad thing. Yeah, maybe. Um, well- and this, these books I felt are very prescient. And the bond crisis and stuff that happened. I mean, this these were all written before the world had the financial crisis that it suffered. And it, it, I, I was listening to an interview where the, uh, someone was saying, "But and yet they feel like they're written after." Mm-hmm. It does. Yeah, but 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 nothing's really that new. I mean, there's been mm-hmm. financial crisis before. There'll be financial True. crisis again. Right. It's True. it's not. It's, I mean, calling someone but, a prophet because you don't read history just makes you an asshole. Mm-hmm. Well, it's not all the assholes, but I think it just shows that good work is timeless and good writing is timeless. I, I guess it shows that, yeah, I mean, sure. Yeah, well, it does. I'm just pointing that out so you can catch up with the rest of us. <laughs> I, I, um, I, anything else that you want to talk about on this book, Wilk? Any other things that you, were important to you? Honestly, the last two or three weeks have been like just, yeah, the news from around the world has just been like a fucking nightmare. It's been like crazy. Yeah. And I, I, and are you are you guys okay? Oh, I'm I'm fine. I'm just sick of old people saying it's the end of the world. Like every time something bad happens, even over seventy, is like it's the end of time. No, you just want to beat death. You want the world to end before yeah, you do. Right. That's true, though. I took a class on ancient Roman history, <laughs> and we and part of it was reading these like obscure texts, um, you know, translations of these obscure texts. And one, I remember one of our teacher pointing out that look at this. It's the same crap that people are saying nowadays. Old people are complaining about the young people and saying the world is going to hell. Right, no, and I, I'm a big People fan. People have been saying yeah. it for thousands of years. There's a great, there's a great print out on Wikipedia of like every doomsday scenario as imagined in society for the last thousand years, and every ten years, people think the world's going to end. But yeah, let's move on to the movie, which I, it's not like a movie per se. It was a film made by the BBC, released as like a two part thing, I think, on the Sky One network. It was directed by John Jones. Um, Wilk, you're going to uh, tell us a little bit about John Jones, and I'm sure it'll be short and sweet. It will be. Um, I went to high school with a guy named John Jones. I looked it up. It is not him. Um, he did not play <laughs> offensive tackle, and he is not Arabic. So um, that made the job a little bit harder. So I had to do some research, which meant I went to both IMDb and Wikipedia, and I found out very little about John Jones. And we know how you feel about Wikipedia. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the name John Jones is quite prevalent on the Internet. He's made a few things, um, you know, a few movies. He's British. As is his uh, movie that I watched. I mean, and, and really, if you like Doctor Who and like that kind of shit, I mean, you'll you'll love this because the production values are. I, I swear to God, I started writing down extras, like trying to trying to see how many times the same extra would be in a, would be in a different role, so they could save money. I mean, they, they, there's maybe twelve extras in the entire movie that they oh. used throughout the whole thing. Uh, the very beginning when they hung the guy, they had guys throwing cabbage off camera. They didn't show the crowd watch him get hung, which really was very distracting to me. I, 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 British. TV has remarkably low budgets. They have really good acting. Also, I thought. Well, I mean, it. I, I don't know, they, man. I thought this was a good production. They have, but they, I don't know. The, the Actors Guild there is a little bit odd, though. Like they have, they have, they don't have a lot of people in it. I mean, they. It's you watch them. Okay, in America, when you when you cast extras, well, we got they get less population, right? No, well, in America, when you cast extras per the uni, the, the union guild contract, you don't have to pay them any like a lot of money if they don't speak. So you can get these big crowd scenes in there somehow. In, in Great Britain, that you don't see these. Big, it's a pain in the ass to get extras. I don't know how or, or why that is, but anyways, it, it, and then I watched it in high definition the first part. Then I immediately went and bought it again 
to not watch in high definition because it was I, I couldn't take it seriously. Needed, yeah, yeah, it was ridiculous. Yeah. But well, no. it's not a movie, right? It's not a blockbuster movie. Well, it's a made for TV. It's a made for thing. TV. It, it, again, yeah. I, I was being serious. The Doctor Who thing. If you like the production values in Doctor Who, it's very similar. I, I, it's not American. It's so it's not. I'm not used to it. I mean, it's it's different. Yeah. It, it's kind of. I, yeah. I like um a lot of British TV shows and stuff. And um two factoids I wanted to put out, which. I'm sure you guys won't care about, but one of the actors, the guy who plays Tulliver Groat is Andrew Sachs, who was in Faulty Towers. I think he paid Manuel in Faulty Towers, which was... Really? John, have you ever seen that? It was with John yeah. Cleese. Yeah. And um, John Cleese wrote that with his wife, and Manuel was the waiter, who is like the third main character. And Oh my god, yeah! Yeah. <laughs> so, that, wow. that is a really funny little miniseries. I don't know. I no, forget but, when they filmed it. But, um. I, don't, I, I love British humor and comedy. I yeah. just I just think their production values. Yeah, were but Faulty Towers is hilarious. And, and, and you know, this is yeah. and that guy, uh, and he I, and he was excellent casting for Groat. I mean, he, he does it to T from straight from the book. And the, I like the other Groat, person yeah. that I noticed was um, Tasman Grieg, who played Miss Cripslack, who was the reporter. She's in another British show that I really liked called Black Book. Uh, I think is actually written uh, by an Irish guy um, about a guy who runs a, a small bookstore and he's kind of bitter and I don't know. It's very it's a very funny show. That's no the, no that's a good show too. But Tywin Lannister, the actor that played him, was the oh British that's right. Yeah, the, uh, the guy who played Tywin Lannister. What is that actor's name? I don't know his oh, name. Oh, it's I, Charles I mean, Dance. I, I did Charles very Dance. little. Yeah. So yeah, he's. Yeah. Very popular now in Game of Thrones. And, it. and he does a very good job as the patrician yeah. in this book. Or this mo- this film. He's got a certain yeah. demeanor about him that he's very good. He, he's also the last action hero. He's a villain. Oh, really? The okay. last action hero, which was, uh, which really isn't that bad of a movie. We should, um, yeah, it's not as bad as it gets credit for. Hmm. It's pretty bad, though. Wow, that was like a good 20 years ago. It's a young, strapping buck back then. So. Then let's move on. And Rick, why don't you give us a quick synopsis of the uh, the BBC film version? You know, just basically what oh. the difference is from the the book. Although, well, that would be kind of like almost going into opinion. But yeah, the book followed the, the film. The, the film. Yeah, I'm sorry. The film. The film followed the, the book pretty closely. I mean, they didn't. Uh, there are so many, you know, instances of uh, embellishment and filigree in the book. I mean, the movie couldn't possibly get into the the, the funny, funny, funny detail of uh, Pratchett's writing, really. You know, I, I think for the most part, the movie was kind of rewritten, but it, it did follow the same exact storyline. It left out, obviously, a lot of information about... Uh, the Grand Trunk Corporation. I mean, yeah, they kind of uh, reduced the Grand Trunk to just Reacher Gilt and one other guy. They did. It was kind of like a one-man show, and it really kind of made him look like a small-time crook. When in the book, he was sort of like this board of directors, and he was very slick. And uh, in the movie, he was more of like this, yeah, they don't more like, of a pirate. They don't than like a, extras. Than a, no extras. Yeah, yeah. exactly. They, seriously, they... just goes to show. So, uh, you know, and he did have his uh, his carryover from the book was uh, Mr. Horsefly, which he ends up beating to death or murdering. But uh, another another element of, of the movie that uh, was a lot different than the book was um, Moist's relationship with um, Adora Deerhart. Adora Deerhart. Adora Bella uh, she, she had a... Adora Bella yeah. Deerhart. She, I thought she was much stronger in the movie than she was um, in the book. You know, she, she did have a prominent role in the book but you know i i think it uh the movie kind of gave her kind of more emphasis and yeah she she kind of had the reins there I and mean, she she had moist by the balls in a few episodes and like the, it was more of a love story i thought yeah, than yeah. than it was kind of like a like a con story you know and um love story was uh more of like an afterthought in the book yeah yeah, yeah. uh so you know that that's pretty much the synopsis i mean it, it uh <laughs> That's not really a synopsis, but I mean, in short, it, it really does kind of follow the book to a T. Uh, it's just okay. kind of watered down. I mean, they can't possibly fit everything. I yet. thought they did um, a very. Good... I'm done. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay, I, I thought they did a really good job with the clax, like the little invention they mm-hmm. came up with it. And I think I saw online that that actually worked. You could use it. What they created, uh, that was kind of fun. I thought it was really fun. And I mean, they dedicate what, like, what four hours or something to this. So they certainly cover a lot of ground, if not everything, which is nice. 
And I thought the casting was really good. I thought all the people in their roles were, were, were just very well cast and very well done. I liked the production value. Mm. I didn't have any of the issues you were mentioning, Wilk, and I just really uh, enjoyed the characters. I've seen it twice now. I saw it a while back, and I remember really liking it, and, and I watched it now more recently. I don't know. It's just a good... It's just a good film, I, and it's and it's on. Uh, well, no, it's it's. Uh, we watched it on, I think, Amazon. It used to be on Netflix for free, but it's not right now. Yeah, it's actually cheaper if you ordered it as a season as opposed to a movie. It's it's kind of odd. It was like four bucks for me. Hmm. Yeah, that it was weird, but uh, but I enjoyed it, and I I don't know. It, I just thought it was fun. I like I I I liked it too. I'm I'm just pointing out that British TV is different than American TV. It, different production values, mm-hmm. and it may not bad. Maybe bad's the wrong word. Just very, it's different. That's all. I mean, it's, it's 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 very obviously British. But I don't think like the, the they didn't really have like cheesy effects. I mean, the the they for the golems they didn't use CGI. They had actually had people in costumes. I they, mean, they maybe couldn't the... afford CGI. Yeah, I mean, for the golems. I mean, no, but the, the golem. Yeah, I like I like them using real makeup. But yeah, it's very. Yeah. I mean, it, it's it, it's just it looks British. It looks British. I mean, if you <laughs> it, it's it, there's no if you had it on mute, I'd say this is a British TV show. This is clearly British. No doubt. They they yeah. did um. They showed Moist having, um, like flashback, or not, I don't know what you'd you call them, flashbacks, where he is remembering his con- what, cons and seeing, and not flashbacks, but he's like having visions of how his cons hurt people. And they had some special effects for that, which I don't think in the book did he really go into that, I don't think. Yeah, they, they did put more guilt on, on, um, the main character. And moist yeah. in the movie than they did in the book. Like, for example, and this is the best example, I think, is when he's talking to Gollum about all of his past, you know, uh, con escapades. And the Gollum tells him that in the book, he tells him that he actually murdered 3.2 people. All right. Just kind of like the, uh, what would you say, the residue of, of his doings, oh, <laughs> taking yeah. people's money and just making people depressed and maybe some people just kill themselves because they've been kind of swindled. In the movie, he kills like 24.8. So they really kind of put the guilt trip on Moist in the movie versus the book. In the book, he, the, all that kind of stuff was portrayed more kind of in a fun-loving way. And it was funny. I mean, you don't really come across... Uh, a lot of uh, fantasy books where it's about a con man and he's very likable. He, he doesn't like to hurt people. He just, you know, wants to make his way through, you know, lies and, and, uh, you know, and the stories about him, bribery and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, the stories about him realizing that even his small time crimes, which he thinks are victimless, are, they do hurt, actually hurt people. Right. And he, he, he just persecuted for it in the book more. It's, it's just, that, that's a big difference, I think. I, I don't know if I have anything else to add about the the movie. I think it's definitely worth watching. I liked it thoroughly. What about you guys? I, I liked it all. Hey, it was okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I, you know, like I go ahead. Well, I I I'll never want to watch it again. I mean, I I I, I made Sorry. myself watch it. It, it I, I I I just don't. I, I didn't like it. I liked the book a lot more, and the actors were distracting to me. I didn't like a lot of the casting. Just the uh, you know. Okay. So. But. Yeah, I, I think the the movie kind of I, – I saw the first half of the movie before I was able to finish the book, and I was pissed off that I saw the movie before I finished the book. Because, you know, it, for me at least, it, it kind of leaves impressions. Uh, it makes me visualize the book yeah. entirely different, you know, kind of assigning yeah. these faces to the, the characters. And I didn't really want that. And the production, like Wilk said, is very British. It's just kind of, you know – done extremely efficiently and you know it's done well for the british movie but i mean it's just i don't know i mean yeah it didn't really do it for me that that much okay all right so tune in next month when we read our next work which is going to be something wicked this way comes Yes, yeah, something wicked this way comes by ray bradbury and something wicked this way comes the movie by jack clayton starring jason robards although was that actual movie or um I hope it's a movie it's a, was it a made, made for tv movie i don't know i haven't i've never seen it and i think the disney was that i don't know but anyways, that's what we'll be doing next month so t- stay tuned we um and we would ask everyone to write reviews on itunes subscribe to our podcast we're also on uh, tune in radio now and feel free to like us on Facebook, and make comments on our website, noyodorant.com. With that, goodbye, everyone. 
Good night. Good night. Bye. Bye. Good night. Post office. For more information on this episode's subject matter and to read our show notes and post your witty comments, visit us at nodeodorant.com. For more information on Ryan Sean O'Reilly and his various works of fiction, visit ryanshawnoreilly.com. For more information on David Wilkinson or Richard Mell, view their profiles at goodreads.com. The theme music for this podcast was written and composed by John Doyle from the band I Decline. Thank you for listening to our podcast. We hope you've learned a lot. Oh, and always remember one thing. There is no deodorant in outer space. You know, but this bullshit now, it's like, they're going to attack Chicago or Vegas. You get these Republican assholes going on the morning news show saying, yeah, they're going to blow up a city. Fuck you, they're not going to blow up a city. They have been they have the same technology they've had for 20 years. They just got some fucking high school kids to make a Macintosh video of them cutting off a guy's head, so it's like, slickly edited. Now we think they're their nuclear power. I mean, these are fucking, I don't know, the, the whole region over there is just nuts. You got Sunnis killing Shiites and anyone in All between. Right, well, okay, we're, we're getting like way off topic. Sorry. <laughs> All right, well. Okay, we, can, we can do the political show next week. I actually want, I, I had a good idea for a, a side podcast with you guys. I can't even hear a short one, but like, where we called, what the hell does a song mean? Where we play a song and we analyze the song. And it, it, it was inspired by listening to Uncle Tom's Cabin by Warren. Oh shit. Then we, you, you know, we gotta do some homework on how to get royalties to do that. Oh. Why don't we just do it and I'll broadcast it and we, you guys can use fake names and I'll get sued. What the fuck <laughs> do I care? <laughs> Alright. So, sounds like we're done talking about the book.